they are really, really valuable speakers. But first of all, they have come from far and wide to help us understand what a just transition is. And so, but first, let us gather our thoughts and our prayers and pray. Thank you, Deacon. And just a quick reminder again to everybody, if you're joining us from other parts of the world and you would like to listen to this webinar in various languages, please go down to the bottom of your screen and click interpretation to the various language you would like. Um, if you're joining us from Italy or would like translation, unfortunately, Zoom does not have Italian, but you would select J uh, Japanese, um, and that is your Italian translation for our Polish uh, brothers and sisters joining us, you would select Russian. So thank you again. And yes, we would move on and begin with our opening prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father of all, creator and ruler of the universe, you entrusted your world to us as a gift. Help us to care for it and all people that we may live in right relationship with you, with ourselves, with one another and with creation. Christ our Lord, both divine and human, you lived among us and died for our sins. Help us to imitate your love for the human, human family by recognizing that we are all connected to our brothers and sisters around the world. To those in poverty impacted by environmental devastation and to future generations. Holy Spirit, giver of wisdom and love, you breathe life in us and give us and guide us. Help us to live according to your vision, steering to action, the hearts of all, individuals and families, communities of faith and civil and political leaders. Triune God, help us to hear the cry of those in poverty and the cry of the earth, so that we may together care for our common home. Thank you very and much. Once again, thank you. We'd like, I'd like to suggest um, the profit advocacy for climate justice. Uh, there's a call to action which the global classic climate change movement is asking us to go for. Um, I would encourage you to look into that. We also have a new fossil fuel divestment uh, initiative, which asks us to, like it says, divest from fossil fuels. To find further information and to read more about our, our campaign, please look into https catholicclimatemovement.org global divest dash and dash reinvest or contact Daniel A at global classic climate movement dot global. Thank you for your interest in this and look forward to seeing how you might want to be able to help us to make a wonderful transition. Now again, um, I ask everybody to read uh, slowly so that we can all understand each other. So if there are any issues with the translations, please let me know so that I can pass it on to our wonderful speakers. Our first speaker today is Reverend Nelly Astidilio. She is a Venezuelan American. She's an eco-theologian and a Presbyterian pastor. In 1998, Nettie co-founded the Angelic Organics Learning Center, a farm-based nonprofit organization in Northern Illinois in the United States, where people connect with food, farming, and caring for earth. Nettie has taught eco-theology for theological seminaries in Guatemala, Bolivia, Peru, Mexico, and the United States and is also an organizer for Green Faith, a multi-faith environmental organization. She lives in Tampa, Florida. It gives me great pleasure for me to introduce Nadi, and please go ahead. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes and good afternoon. 
Thank you for this very special opportunity to talk about lifestyle changes. Um, I am aware that as I, I speak as a Latina, as an immigrant to the United States, and as a Christian woman who has been involved in environmental ministry since uh, my teenage years. Uh, and from my life experience, I know that lifestyle changes uh, require, first of all, an understanding of our impact in the world, our footprint, how our human activities are affecting the health of the planet and or even our health. It also requires a partner or a community for ongoing support along this journey. It requires a system to provide us with the right choices or the courage and the resources to step outside of the dominant culture and the system to create a better world from scratch, if at all possible. But then you need to come back and teach others, just like Jesus came back from the mountain after um, with the disciples. And it also requires to sustain it, the altruistic values of our faith values like solidarity, love, justice, compassion, wonder, values of collaboration, a culture of enough, a belief in God's providence and the goodness and life-giving power of our planet, animals, plants, soils, climate, all working in unison to sustain life. When we are blessed to have a faith tradition that teaches all of this, if we pay attention to its teachings. When I think about lifestyle changes, I like to think about my own life and how I arrived to this understanding gradually. I first began my ecological activism as a young woman, joining uh, a marine mammal conservation um, organization back in Venezuela, where I'm from. As a sociology student, I was able to convince one of my professors to let me do uh, a research about the killing of dolphins by the shark uh, fisheries in the east coast of Venezuela. I had no idea what led uh, fishermen to kill dolphins to use as bait for shark fishing, but I felt cold and I was supported. By moving uh, to those communities allowed me to understand a complex world where the killing of dolphins was related to several other things that were working together. For example, the lack of environmental laws to protect marine biodiversity, where governments allowed industrial fishing fleets to fish very close to shore, taking all kinds of fish in, of all sizes threatening sustainable indigenous local cultures and who depended on this uh, fish, leading local indigenous fishermen then to adopt non-sustainable fishing practices, practices that went against their own environmental values and culture, and not having enough fish close to shore to catch with uh, uh, simple boats meant that they now needed to go farther out into the sea and they needed bigger boats to do that. And to go out with those boats, they needed motors, engines to catch. Uh, and catching uh, the sharks became uh, their way by selling their fins. They could provide them with enough resources then that they needed to continue being fishermen, which is what they felt they were called to do. But the shark fins were not consumed by Venezuelans or by these uh, communities. They were sold in the market to be later sent to the United States or other Asian countries, which consumed shark fin soup as a luxury. So that was probably my first experience with environmental damaging consumption patterns and practices stimulated by a global market threatening not only sharks and dolphin populations, but indigenous peoples and cultures. It was later moving now to the United States 
that pose no challenges for me, obviously. Living in one of the countries that consumes more natural resources than we have or produce, a country that creates more pollution that we can manage, recycle or reuse is very challenging. If I just stay within the dietary challenges, for example, I know now that the tomatoes, mangoes, papayas, corn, and many other products common to the Southern hemisphere do not grow here all year long. And this provokes a tension between wanting to continue eating the same way I always did as a way also to maintaining my Latin American culture and even sharing that culture with my children and at the same time wanting to live sustainably. My environmental mind says, no, you cannot eat tomatoes all year long without affecting the environment. Because in the US, most of the food that we consume has traveled 1300 miles away prior to arriving to our table. My footprint here is bigger just by the fact of living where I am. And my Latin American mind, missing home, just wanted to continue living the same way. So in my case, it wasn't just goodwill, I have to say, or even environmental awareness of my lifestyle uh, impact, what finally led me to change my, my dietary habits. It was when I was diagnosed with endometriosis and found my own body now in need of healing from what was probably caused by chemical pollution. I had two options, consuming drugs for the rest of my life to ease the symptoms or trying to let nature heal me, detoxifying my body. Thank goodness I chose the latter. And that led me to seek sources of clean food, organic food, fresh, nutritious food, not just the ingredients I was used to eat or food that came, uh, comes even organically 1,300 miles away from home, from where I live now. And this, this journey led me, with support of my husband, to connect with a local farmer and a farming community, community-supported agriculture. This provided the ingredient that I pointed out at the beginning that it is important to have a support for our lifestyle changes, a community. And the miracle was that, and in my own healing process, I was also allowing the earth to heal as well. It is interesting, but as I was reflecting for this uh, talk, and I looking at my experience, I realized that in this new approach to the new land I now call home, I began to learn new ways of eating. I began to know the land I lived. In. I began to appreciate and learn to appreciate the joy of eating local, eating in season, awaiting for it. And also, I also enjoyed, appreciated knowing who grew my food person and a group of people who are now part of my community, which I also supported through my own eating habits. So we were supporting one another. So to make a long story short, as you already heard, my husband and I fell in love with the countryside. And although we did our best while living in the city to live sustainably by giving ourselves even a year to make all the changes we thought were possible from learning how to compost in our home, from growing a few things in our garden, from stopping to use our plastic bags, from walking and using public transportation. Uh, at the end for us, uh, in, in one side, it, it, we felt that just living in the city was not sustainable enough the way that we wanted at least, but also what happened is that we felt cold. We felt called to move to the land. I would say the land called us. <laughs> so when I finished seminary, we moved our family to Northern Illinois to start a learning center at the Angelic Organics Farm, uh, where we were uh, members. So now all people who also wanted to connect with the land, with farmers and food, 
uh, could have a place to explore these issues and find a community to support them. And we did that for 20 years. And yes, my body calmed down and I lived without symptoms for all those 20 years. But as we come back to, to, to all of us, it is true that not everyone, of course, can, um, can make this life-changing, sort of dramatic choices. And so we see that really wherever we live, wherever we are, uh, we can continuously continue asking ourselves, uh, how can we live more sustainably? How can I make sure that my community has a possibility to have access to more sustainable choices, no matter our income levels? Um, and at Green Faith, uh, where I work, a multi-faith environmental organization with the mission of inspiring and educating people of faith for environmental action. We like to talk about three pathways to power, to okay. make power as the means in which we can make changes in our life. Reverend and Never, we want to thank you enough for your, for your presentation so far. Yes. Would you be able to close it down, uh, close it off in a couple of points? I know you're just about to end. Yes. But we're for the sake of time, if you yes. could perhaps wrap it up just a little bit in the end so that we have time to have adequate time for question and answers. Please. Well, well, well taken. Yes, very good. So we, we recognize again the, the need of personal transformation. That's why we're talking about lifestyle changes. Um, we also recognize the need to transformation, transforming our institutions, our communities. We know that organizing also uh, requires and makes that possible. And we recognize that when people come together, uh, we change cultures, we change our culture. Uh, and as more and more people feel this cold, we have the possibility to affect a system change, which is so necessary so everybody can have these choices. Um, and so just to finalize very quickly, I, I wanted to share with you um, the Living the Change, which is a campaign that uh, we have uh, available for all people to be part of, participate or to learn from. And this is a resource uh, you can find on livingthechange.net where people can evaluate their lifestyle, commit to making changes, uh, look at the way that they eat, they use energy uh, and transportation. Um, this resource is also available in Spanish. And uh, if you go to menu, you can find that uh, at the bottom of the, of the page. Uh, it has some really good resources that I would recommend going to working with faith communities and yourself. Um, and I like this infographic, which is there, which in reality shows what aspects of our lifestyles we really need to consider in order to have a bigger impact, especially as we look at these issues from a climate concern. Um, what parts of our lifestyle really has a big impact uh, uh, positively in reversing climate change, which is one of our, our um, concerns at this time. So I just invite you to go to livingthechange.net and look for more information there uh, and look forward to staying connected to share more questions, any answers to, to give answers to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on light of that, I would remind everyone that they can, if they have some questions that this wonderful presentation has, has uh, brought, that they can make their questions and add them into the chat. Um, and so that we can, we can get that uh, together and start answering the questions ahead of time. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce, um, I also to introduce, the next speaker, uh, she's going to be talking about dis divestment, and this is Sister Joan. Um, she is a Franciscan sister of the con of a con in a congregation in Rochester, Minnesota, who is affiliated with the Mayo Clinic. She is executive director of uh, of New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light. Um, she works with faith communities and folks on various aspects of climate change. She attended the UN climate conferences in Copenhagen and in Paris and lives and works out of Albuquerque, 
New Mexico in the Southwest of the United States. So it gives me and everyone a great pleasure for me to do Sister Joan, please. Um, we look forward to uh, hearing from you. And again, if you have any questions that come off that are, that are sprout out from the ground during the course of our wonderful presentation, please be sure to enter them into the chat. Sister Joan, I hand it off to you. Thank you so much. And I'm very pleased to be with all of you. So blessings this day around the world and in many time frames. Um, as I begin, I'd like to just um, offer um, thanksgiving for this place, this uh, land that I um, sit upon and, and work in as a uh, land of the Tewa people of New Mexico. And as we continue through this presentation today, pray for all of that ancestral blessings and that this work might be uh, one that honors um, these people. So thank you. Um, I'd also like to just uh, mention um, some women who have worked for climate justice around the world who uh, walk with us and give us courage in these new areas of climate change and remembering uh, Berta Caceres, uh, Juan Gothi Mathai and Sister Dorothea Stang. So um, my community, I'm gonna tell a little story about our divestment process and how we've done that with my Franciscan community, which is based in Rochester, Minnesota. And traditionally we've had the ministries of uh, healing, education and social service and other uh, political engagement as well uh, for change and structural change. Our headquarters is in Rochester, Minnesota. We currently have about 160 sisters and about that same number of co-members, but uh, we are not interchanged with them in our finances. And we uh, serve throughout the United States and we've been in various countries over the years and we currently have ministry and sisters in Colombia, um, South America. So I'd like to start with chili peppers. And I have all kinds of chili peppers here. In New Mexico, um, I'm in my backyard and we have lots of gardens and um, chilies we grow lots of. We grow uh, sandias and we grow hatch and um, stuffing chili peppers, poblano chili peppers, um, red jalapenos. I mean, we have all kinds of chili peppers. And I want to use these chili peppers as an example of how we can look at divestment. Because divestment oftentimes is something that people shy away from even talking about because they say, I'm not financially savvy to do this. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to start. So uh, living in the natural world as a Franciscan, all kinds of things teach us. And so the chili peppers have taught me and teach people here because we have a lot of seed saving of these seeds that are used that are centuries old seeds and keep growing. And they're planted every year. And some years, some of them have to be discarded because they're no longer good, or maybe they got moldy. Or maybe like this year, I grew too many chili peppers and the poor um, you know, egg plants are very sad. So maybe I should dispose of some of those seeds because something else is taking over and I need to have more diversity. So for me, this is what divestment is about from fossil fuels. So um, for a time, you know, uh, we all had cars with gasoline, we heated our homes with oil, etc. And those of us that um, have money to invest, and in my community, we do that because we have so many retired sisters and sisters retiring that we've had to plan for their future. So we invested in these kinds of things like gas extractivism, et cetera. Um, but over time, just how I explained with our chilies maybe taking over, um, we realized that we had to divest from some of this because creation is suffering, because people are suffering. And so as much as I might like gas or chilies, maybe I need some other things as well. So um, we began this process uh, first by holding our Franciscan values and our reasons. And, and that really relates to we're all brothers and sisters. Climate change is the largest threat to life on the planet. Um, fossil fuels um, pollute the air. We um, live and work for the economically poor and they're suffering the most, those who are vulnerable. 
And so we began this journey of looking more deeply and deeply over the years at climate change and climate justice and how we might engage. So in 2007, 2007, we did a corporate stance on climate change in my community. And um, from there, we moved into various ways that we, to live this out, to enflesh this as Franciscan sisters and uh, co-members. So we began looking at fossil fuel divestment, which really aims to reduce carbon emissions by accelerating the adoption of renewable energy transition by stigmatizing fossil fuel companies. So that includes putting public pressure on the companies that are involved in fossil fuel extraction, but it also means investing or reinvesting in other types of energy. And uh, for me, this is also a personal thing. Living in New Mexico, we have the Permian Basin. It's one of the, it's called the Saudi Arabia of the world right now. We have a lot of oil and gas industry, 38% of our state budget goes to, um, is, comes from that to pay for education, our social services, and we're a very economically challenged um, state, as well as what I call a sacrifice zone because of these extractivisms. So we have to consider all of that. And that's very personal for me. Also, when I went to the climate change meetings in Copenhagen, I met people from around the world and saw the suffering even more close hand. A trip to India and Bangladesh helped solidify that. Uh, we work here with a lot of immigrants and refugees here in New Mexico as a border state. And I attended the 2015 UN climate meeting. So all of those things influenced me personally and I share that with my community. So how did we do this and what did we do? It began in about 2013 and I brought, I'm on the finance committee of our community and I brought um, up that maybe we needed to divest from fossil fuels. And we didn't know a whole lot about it and there weren't a lot of tools at the time. So um, the finance committee said, yes, do a presentation. So in 2014, I did a presentation and invited our, um, uh, our investment manager, Kathy Allison, from Morgan Stanley to be part of that. So we had this discussion. And with that, we bit by bit educated the community. We said, let's go forward with this. And um, we began to work with Kathy and Morgan Stanley to find places to reinvest our funds because we have a very diverse portfolio and we have to for the retirement needs of our community. And at that time, there was a great challenge. There were not as many tools as they are today. So in 2015, uh, we had a presentation from Trillium, one of our investment managers, and also from a manager from Pox World to share about their environmental market, market funds and, and what they had to offer us. We continued to do our research through many organizations. And in 2016, uh, we with Morgan Stanley um, began to really divest. And at that time, Morgan Stanley launched their climate change and fossil fuel aware toolkit to collaborate closely with asset managers and industry to advance climate investing opportunities. So we began moving forward with this and our divestment took approximately four years from 2016 to 2020. About 65% of that divestment was, took place in the first two years. And the last two years from 2018 to 2020 were spent addressing bond maturities, fossil fuel investments that were, we were holding because they were doing good work with talking to corporate executives to make change and waiting for um, some opportunities we knew would come forth to reinvest in really positive and good ways. So as of today, 2020, we are basically divested from fossil fuels totally, uh, except for our indexes. Our investment policy uh, has very diverse and it includes indexes and indexes cannot be monitored in that way. So the results of all of this for us have been very positive. One of the concerns of the community is, would we lose money and then not have enough for our sisters? Would we not be able to be socially engaged um, and make change uh, through these fossil fuel companies? 
And none of those things happened. We did not lose money. In fact, because of the way the markets have gone, and we all know that fossil fuels will be a stranded asset, that we withstood those market ups and downs. Also, we still are able to do good work because of our managers of our funds who meet with large corporate executives for social concerns in very good ways. It's also allowed us to reinvest at very local levels. We have solar panels on our property, our mother house property. We invested in energy efficiency in our building, which is an older building from the 1950s. And it has the highest rating for that type of building we can get with EPA Energy Star. We invested in startup solar and wind. Uh, we also invested in um, a new project with the National Catholic Reporter recently, Earthbeat. We also have new tools, and some of these new tools are involve um, international investing as well, like KKR and Climate Solutions Fund. And um, the Climate Solutions Fund actually was started um, in accordance with the Dominican Sisters. And um, this has been wonderful because it's a way of living out Laudato Si, and that was the implication or the initiative for that. So we're very grateful to throw in our hat with the Dominican sisters. Um, so overall, divestment does not put at risk, if it's done wisely, investments that one needs, that an organization needs, a church needs, a congregation needs, or individuals need. And there are more and more opportunities and tools to do this. Um, with energy efficiency technologies, adaptation mitigation, food, et cetera. One of our funds now really uses the UN Sustainable Development Goals, addressing water, sanitation, food security, and energy, and those challenges for economically challenged people. So another result has been that we have been, uh, we put out that we've done this, which I think we need to not hide our light under a bushel basket. And so we have done that and we have won um, like a 2019 environmental award from the Rochester City Public Utilities. And Kathy Allison, who's been working closely with us, um, has learned so much that she is now one of 40 specialized people in this area with Morgan Stanley and she herself has won awards. And we appreciate that as a woman because often women are not in these areas of investment. So to close with, I'd like to just draw on Francis and Claire and Teilhard. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin said, the physical structure of the universe is love. So all of this work with our physical resources has been done out of love. And Francis and Claire of Assisi see and saw all as brothers and sisters and as healers and spiritual guides and addressing social concerns and injustices in their time. And for us, this is one of many of the ways we can address climate change, climate justice through divestment and reinvestment in new horizons. So thank you very much, blessings. Sister Joan, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I'm sure there are a lot of wonderful thoughts and ideas that you can, that the, our audience can have um, for this, for your presentation on divestment. Um, please, if you have any thoughts, please write them down or perhaps add them to the chat. We will have enough space for time for that to do so later. Our next um, speaker today is uh, Andrew Conradi. He is a secular Franciscan. He was educated in private schools in England, followed by McGill University and the University of British Columbia in Canada. He holds a master's in urban and regional planning, which he practiced in Northern Vancouver, British Columbia. He studied justice, peace, and integrity of creation at the Pontifical Antonianum in Rome and was appointed at JPIC animator for both the Franciscan friars and the seculars in Western Canada and also nationally with the seculars. During the Cold War, he served in the Canadian army where he commanded an armored reconnaissance regiment and was subsequently posted to senior staff positions. He was a high school teacher. He was a high school teacher of ge geography and history and is very interested in Catholic social doctrine. He is married with one son and two stepdaughters 
and has five grandchildren. It gives me great pleasure for me to introduce Andrew Conradi, and I hand it over to you. Thank you very much, sir. I got to remember to unmute myself. And you're fine. my presentation is going to be by slide so that you can see it. And wait a minute. Have you got it? Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So um, I have. I'm going to be focusing on the dicastery for promotion of integral human developments new document called journeying towards care for our common home, which of course is about Laudato Si. I first wish to acknowledge and thank the Likungan people of the place to smoke herring, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations communities for allowing me to live, work, pray and play on their lands. On the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si this year, the dicastery calls for renewed action in a, in a new document which came out on the 16th of May called Journeying Towards Care for Our Common Home. This was on how to implement the action required by Laudato Si. Although the English translation has only been available to me since the 21st of September, and it's very long, from the overview, we can start thinking and planning action. Basically, Catholic communities around the world are invited to join a grassroots movement and not just Catholic communities, any community, and to gradually work towards total sustainability in the coming decade, including carbon neutrality, simpler lifestyles, and divestment from fossil fuels. And Sister Joan and Reverend Nettie, you'll be happy to know that I am a great believer in eating local blackberries. And on Saturday, I'm going to get some. Here is the link to the uh, English version of journeying, which you, you, you can get this later. Chapter four of Laudato Si and the Amazon Synod were concerned with integral ecology. Journeying chapter four includes the crucial issues, sorry, chapter four of Laudato Si includes the crucial issues of our day in an integrated approach to a complex crisis. And here they are, just some of them nutrition, water, energy, ecosystems, deforestation, desertification, use of the soil, seas and oceans, finance, work, justice and public administration, health, climate change, education, the dignity of human life, interfaith and ecumenical dialogue, the economy, Communications, as Pope Francis said in Laudato Si, everything is connected. Did I forget anything? Oh, 20 minutes should be enough for all of that. Moving right along. Integral human development, in case you are wondering. Pope St. Paul the VI said back in 1967, development cannot be limited to mere economic growth alone. He's I know I'm preaching to the converted in, in repeating his words, I realize that. In order to be authentic, it must be complete, integral, integrated in other words. That is, it has to promote the good of every person and of the whole person. 
The Australians uh, bishops have said integral human development is the holistic development of the human person covering all aspects of life, social, economic, political, cultural, personal, and spiritual. In other words, we are not just economic animals. Here, a few days ago was the World Day of Migrants and Refugees. refugees. And in um, a document called Life After the Pandemic, it was pointed out that in Laudato Si, Pope Francis had said, uh, he pointed to the growing exodus of climate migrants and environmental refugees and their vulnerability and the interconnectedness between the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. We are all on the same boat. How often I've heard local indigenous people paint pictures of us all in the same canoe. And if you fool around in a canoe, you're gonna tip it up. Cardinal Cerny, a Jesuit, wrote in the preface to this document, why not switch to something better? Why reinvest in fossil fuels, monoculture farming, and rainforest destruction when we know they worsen our environmental crisis? I think we all know the answer to that and it's greed on the part of certain people. Again, in uh, this, this day of the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, we prayed and that's only the first two lines of the prayer. Merciful God and Father of all, wake us from the slumber of indifference. I would say that most of you that I am talking to today uh, on this webinar already know that. So I, I say to the rest of my, my friends in Canada and the USA, who harvests our food and under what condition? I think you know. I've been asked to focus on a couple of key points in journeying and some implications for this renewed action to implement Laudato Si. If it's renewed, it means they've tried it before, but we've got to renew it. We need to keep going and hit it harder and hit the nail on the head sort of thing. So what are the first things journeying requires us to do? been in preparation for a long time before pre, it's pre-COVID. In St. Peter's Square in May 2014, Pope Francis said, if we destroy creation, creation will destroy us. That's, that is such a key point. Later, he told an Italian journalist, Carlo Perini, we need to change our paradigms very quickly. I stress that very quickly if we want to have a future. And here's a, that same point put in different words. Nature does not need people. People need nature. And here was a warning from uh, his document, Commun uh, Humana Communitas on the 22nd of July this year. He said, we have built for ourselves an ethos of prevarication and disregard. That just means delay and denial for what is given to us in the elemental promise of creation. And now we have a challenge as the previous speakers have, have also stressed. And I'm, I'm gonna quote a, a Japanese bishop elect who said, the church must help make sure post COVID-19 economic recovery is based on ethical I stress ethical investments that protect the poor and the environment from exploitation and neglect. As uh, St. Francis of Assisi said, let us begin again for up to now we have done little or nothing. And as the idle no more movement in Canada has said, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. Rise up. And if that means civil disobedience, so be it, I'm there. Pope Francis on the World Day of Prayer, the care of creation this year said, 
who is going to pay the ecological debt? Today, not tomorrow, today we have to take care of creation responsibly. Let us pray that the planet's resources will not be plundered, but shared in a just and respectful manner. No to plundering, yes to sharing. So often I have had some of my fellow Franciscans say, oh, you can't change things overnight. You must be patient. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not with that patience. We're running out of time. Extractivism, worldwide awareness is needed. Here we have a young lady, Nina Gualenga. She's from Sarayaku uh, in Ecuador. She says, we must keep the oil in the ground. We must defend the Amazon. We must fight against climate change. We must protect the environment. She's following in her mother's footsteps. And here's her mom, Patricia Gualenga. She's an Amazonian Quichua indigenous leader from Sarayaku in Ecuador. She's received death threats for protecting her land and people. Both of her daughters are activists. She speaks frequently on fossil fuel divestment, including at the Amazon Synod. And recently on the 5th of June this year, she wrote, since its publication, the response to the encyclical, Laudato Si, has been slow, even within the structure of the Catholic Church, which causes me to say, no kidding. The statement of the European Christian Environmental Network, I'll read it. For many years, some churches have been working for climate justice, but we confess that we too had been doing too little and without the full support of our church leaders. Again, I say, no kidding. We th that's why we have to renew it, the call to implement Laudato Si. We therefore take seriously the call of young people to change the ways of society and of our churches. This has to change fast. Activists like us, the I'm not young anymore, but I'm young at heart in that sense. We have to nudge some of our bishops, our leaders to actually lead. Now, I think you've probably already got my take on journeying, but I'll continue. Laudato Si objectives in way back in 2018 were the 1.5 guardrail, which is self-explanatory, the, the temperature rise, transition to a circular economy. Uh, that'll be on the next slide. You probably know what it is anyway. But here we're getting to three and four, greater involvement of faith communities about time is what I say, and empower a people's movement. Because if we don't, it's gonna happen outside our churches without us. Anyway, this, here's a nice neat little picture. I'm sure you understand it. The circular economy is one that exchanges the typical cycle of make, use and dispose in favor of as much reuse and recycling as possible. Now, Catholics are to be asked for greater involvement in a grassroots movement. Grassroots for Catholics means in the family and the parish. So um, the Laudato Si action platform and goals are going to work in gradual stages. Yeah, I don't like gradual, but that's a fact of life. It will invite Catholic entities to publicly commit to a seven year journey towards ecological conversion and total sustainability. That means I wanna hear it from my bishop and my pastor and not every bishop and every pastor has really been strongly doing this. So here is a diagram. I'll let you look at this for a moment. If you start at the top, these are the goals of the Laudato Si uh, action platform. And I leave you with a question. Is your diocese or parish 
organized to implement them. Cry of the earth, cry of the poor, economics, simple lifestyles, education, spirituality, and engagement and participatory action. Pope Francis said to the second world meeting of popular movements way back in 2015, the future of humanity does not lie solely in the hands of great leaders. Thank God for that is what I say after having seen a couple recently. The great powers and the elites, it is fundamentally in the hands of peoples and in their ability to organize. The urgent need, he said, for a bold cultural revolution in Laudato Si. And here are two good sources, the Laudato Si revolution and the Laudato Si movement. There are many others, many, many others. Now, I just want to draw attention to talking the talk and walking the walk. Here I have a, a lovely um, poster from the Archdiocese of Toronto quoting Pope Francis. What kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us, to children who are now growing up? Wonderful to quote Pope Francis. That was in 2018. Then I, in red, I've added that question. Has Toronto divested from fossil fuel investment yet? And it's that lovely picture of a seed growing. It's in, our, it's in our hands. Yes, it's in our hands if we organize and raise our voices. I'd just like you to read this, but maybe I should read it. And I don't think I really should comment any further. It's very difficult to believe. I am quoting, the, the recommendation on fossil fuel stocks is certainly something the Archdiocese of Toronto would want to think about, Millway told the Catholic Register. If we get something concrete from the Vatican that says we really ought to consider divestment, we will read it carefully. I promise you that, he said. Yeah. Where's he been? We need a bold cultural revolution. It's time to wake up, walk the walk and not just talk the talk. And to me, I don't think just to me, climate is now the ultimate pro-life issue. Every, all the other good things they do just won't matter if we don't solve the existential, uh, existential problem of climate change. And moving right along, here is Pope Francis talking to the previous uh, president who acted like a president, forgive that aside. And he invited contrast with the civil rights struggle by invoking the spirit of Martin Luther King in support of his argument. Here's what Martin Luther King said. I'm saying is history repeating itself. In 1963, when he led the march to Washington, he said, I quote, we are confronted with the fierce urgency of now in this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. Many are saying exactly the same today about climate change, racism, and COVID-19, especially that organization called Creation Justice, which I believe is Presbyterian, and it's, it's really very good, and I recommend it. At present, the Laudato Si action platform remains an invitation to Catholic entities to commit to complete the goals in the seven years, 2023 to 2030. To me, the key point is why wait to be invited? The first thing we can do is start now planning and offering to volunteer and organize. So 
If you go to the Franciscan Voice Canada website, you can find a suggested letter to our bishop, your bishop, with a copy to our, to your pastor. Invite an offering to volunteer for the grassroots movement. Most of us know who the most likely people are. We know that there are organizations in the parish that need to be nudged and budged. There were two bright spots. The Alberta bishops in 1998, I'll go down to the red bit, the question, how is the call to biblical stewardship communicated in the preaching, sacramental celebration, educational programs, and management decisions of our parishes and church organizations. The Canadian uh, Conference Catholic Bishops put out a really good pastoral letter in 2003. But here was a very bright spot. Bishop Luke Bouchard of St. Paul, Alberta in 2009 issued his excellent high profile pastoral statement the integrity of creation and the Athabasca oil sands. It outlined Catholic social teaching and applied it to the oil sands and questioned the moral legitimacy of the Athabasca development. Unfortunately, this pastoral seems to have been filed away and forgotten. It's like the bishops are frightened of poking the politician, the politicians. Well, they shouldn't be because we, the faithful of the church, we're not frightened. It's, this is worth reading and promoting, and, and here's the link. I had difficulty finding it, and where did I find it? I found it on an American Franciscan website. God bless American Franciscans. God bless Americans. So my question, did you and your parish hear about these? Even virtually, if you had to, the season of creation. Well, obviously you've heard about it. You people have. But did your parish, in your parish, did you hear about Laudato Si Week this year? Because my parish didn't. My pastor had not heard about it. So if not, then we need to ask why, starting with our leader, the bishop. Hopefully in future you will hear. And I think it is picking up. I hope it is. So none of these are new, the seven R's. You, you've all seen them, you all know them. Well, now we have a seventh one. It's a spiritual revolution, an eighth one. So what can we do? Well, we have to raise awareness and advocate, ask people to take and sign the Laudato Si pledge. Um, one parish I know and nearby made a magnetic fridge stickers of the pledge, ask all, that all coffee, tea, and sugar served in your parish be certified. Okay, I'm, I'm mentioning CWL, that's a Canadian organization. Development and Peace is an organ, a, a Canadian organization, but the Knights, they're, they're very American. All parish meetings, ask for compostable paper plates and no single use plastic. Use tap water rather than bottle water, because a lot of bottle water originally comes from the tap. Suggest a parish energy audit. Show us that there's a great seven minute video by a, a very impassioned um, Franciscan friar from India. Really great, love him. So we need to really remind many of our, our not just Catholics, but our, our, our Christians, spirituality includes a political dimension. Here it is, faith, hope, and charity. Of these, the greatest is charity. Pope Pius, way back in 1927, spoke of political charity as one of the highest forms of the virtue of charity. Pope Francis was only echoing him when he said, politics, according to the social doctrine of the church, is one of the highest forms of charity because it serves the common good. And he went on to say, a good Catholic meddles in politics. I would say a good Christian. I would say a good person meddles in politics. 
So, and out of Laudato Si, just in case you're wondering, society, I'll just read the red, must put pressure on governments to develop more rigorous regulations, procedures, and controls. Unless citizens control political power, national, regional, and municipal, it will not be possible to control damage to the environment. So all of us doing our, our, our own family things isn't going to be enough. We've got to force, sorry, persuade our politicians, our bishops to take a leading role. Because if they leave it to industry, ain't going to happen. Although some of the um, energy uh, companies now are starting to realize they got to get into solar energy, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So our bishops have got to lead us. That's all I'm saying. No, it's not all I'm saying. It's part of what I'm saying. So we must join others. Um, on the Global Day of Climate Action, which passed, I don't know if you were able to do anything. There's a picture of what it was uh, in 2019 in Vancouver. I was in Victoria, actually, but just think. What did I say at the bottom there? Think of the effect if a bishop joined them. Let me repeat that. Think of the effect if a bishop joined them. What would the young people think? Would they think, hey, these guys are real leaders. I'm going back to church. St. Francis of Assisi wrote a letter to the rulers of the people. And it wasn't about politics as we know it today. But he wrote to the rulers of the people. Would you, I say to my, my friends, my Catholic friends, would you add your name to an open letter sent to world leaders about the climate crisis? Greta, uh, Greta Thunberg and, and three other young ladies from Europe signed it. Would you write to Prime Minister Trudeau about the Trans Mountain expansion? I hope you would. So here, the Global Catholic Climate Movement has a petition in support of Pope Francis. Unite with Catholics, not just Catholics from all continents to ask for a coronavirus response that embraces sharing, not plundering. Help him, he needs help. We all need help. In 2020, Canada is not on track to meet our targets. To do so, we need a radical systemic change. Systemic, now where have I heard that word recently? Anyway, here's a good book, A Good War. Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. It only came out on the 1st of September. Oh, I haven't read it yet. And here are the posters. There's one from the war, Royal Canadian Air Force fighting. And then let's do it again. I say, yeah, let's do it again and again and again and again. Sustainable energy resources. The one on the right. I wish you, Kulaval is um, from Chiapas. It means thank you. I work with some of the people down there on their coffee harvest. I wish you peace and joy. Pope Francis is now asking us, go repair our common home. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your wonderful presentation, um, Andrew. I, it's been, there's a lot of information there and a lot of links that we can go to. And just to reassure everyone, that slide will be available to, for people. Um, it is wonderful that you've mentioned uh, Pope Francis in the closing today. Um, we have um, a wonderful video that Pope Francis put forward um, about this, but I would like to invite everyone to leave your question in the chat box. And please specify to whom the question is addressed. If it is a question that is to everyone, then go to everyone. But uh, we will be receiving questions at the moment. Um, and please do so. We really would love to have, love to be able to answer your questions. But I'd like to uh, bring everybody's attention and draw in you into a series of videos that Pope Francis has done called, at the, called the Pope Video. Um, and this one is especially important for our time during the season of creation. 
he wrote it for this, and it is it is as much a grassroots uh, production. So um, if we could perhaps share that and have a listen to it, um, it really does put everything together. What you've been mentioning, what all of you have been mentioning this uh, this uh, webinar. So please, I invite you all to uh, watch this video. Estamos exprimiendo los bienes del planeta, exprimiéndolos, como si fuera una naranja. Países y empresas del norte se han enriquecido explotando dones naturales del sur, generando una deuda ecológica. ¿Quién va a pagar esta deuda? Además, la deuda ecológica se agranda cuando multinacionales hacen fuera de sus países lo que no se les permite hacer en los suyos. Es indignante. Hoy, no mañana, hoy, tenemos que cuidar la creación con responsabilidad. Recemos para que los bienes del planeta no sean saqueados, sino que se compartan de manera justa y respetuosa. No al saqueo, sí al compartir. Thank you for this wonderful video. I encourage everyone to use, to put into a search engine's Pope video. He, uh, he is, this is a wonderful resource to get an idea as to what Pope Francis is thinking and how he wants to lead, uh, not only Catholic, but those of all of goodwill um, in this direction. And now we have time for some questions um, and we could see whether we can get to those. Um, I hand it over to, um, those questions that have to be answered. Can you go yes. on that, please? Finger. Thank you, Deacon. We have one question from Julia asking, has any one of you heard of any plans to initiate trainings for seminarians, deacons, priests, and bishops uh, regarding Laudato Si and liturgical season of creation? I have to say that I uh, don't have very close links with seminary anymore. I, I, I used to, but not anymore, so I don't know. But I have a feeling that things are going to change, but I'm not sure how far they have already changed. I suspect in certain religious orders, in certain seminaries, this might have started. I suspect that the Franciscans probably have, and not just them, the Jesuits too, and, and others. But I, I don't think any of us really know because no one else spoke up. Um, I, I know in the past, Laudato Si came out here in the United States, there was a very, it, well, there's a small effort uh, focused on some places to try to educate priests um, in certain dioceses. Um, there hasn't been a real follow up to that. And um, I have to say, climate change is still not um, a concern that is high profile, or is integrated into other concerns like immigration, refugees, economic poverty, um, racism, and, and those areas. So I would just say there's a lot of work that needs to be done. However, people might petition the, the bishops and their pastors and seminaries if you have any in your state. Yes, thank you. And our staff member, which is a Franciscan a brother, Brother Ben mentions that yes. yes, in Rome at the Tonium University, there yes. is a diploma course on Laudato Si. Yes. Um, and then so the follow-up question is that how can we work together to help initiate that? How can, I think, Andrew gave some great examples of really be, being the grassroots and pushing, but 
perhaps many of you, I know Reverend just posted some things and the Green Faith Fellowship Program, um, but perhaps maybe you have some great ideas of how we can initiate that. Um, I, I think the church needs to just continually hear from, the leaders need to continually hear from um, ordinary people. Yeah. I mean, this is all of our responsibility. The leadership comes from everywhere. We're all leaders or invited to that by um, the gospel and uh, baptism. And so we all need to be part of that and pushing that if it's not happening as um, we feel that it should. Great, thank you. And I had a question that came earlier and I really appreciate um, you presenters that were answering some questions during uh, other presentations in the chat. That's always great to keep people engaged. So really thank you on that. One other question that came through was, have you heard, any of you heard of the Poor People's Campaign like Pax Christie uses? And if so, could you maybe elaborate that? And if you haven't, great. Maybe this is something we'd like to share with others. Um, so, uh, yeah, here in New Mexico, we have been engaged in the Poor People's Campaign. In fact, when it was being initiated, I can't even remember how, several years ago, we had uh, basically the first um, unveiling of that and had a very large interfaith event here with over a thousand people of faith in a Methodist church. Um, since then, we certainly hold those tenants, which are very good uh, integrating together um, uh, racism, um, economic poverty, injustice, uh, environmental degradation, <coughs> um, voting, all of those elements. And um, so I think that those tenants lifted up is really another way of looking at integral ecology. We have to make connect the dots with those concerns. And here in New Mexico, we are in, engaged um, and are actually planning an event in Albuquerque Civic Plaza for later in the month with those moral um, tenants. Thank you. And then just to follow up of the previous question, many of our participants have mentioned that there's a couple dioceses that have already began these initiatives, which is the Diocese of Chicago that's done a lot of work regarding Laudato Si, Diocese of New York. So that's very uh, empowering to hear that there is some diocese. And if you're in those local areas, I would really invite you to connect with them, see how we can help <clears throat> continue their growth and also learn from them so that we can spread um, that message. <clears throat> if there is any other questions, uh, please enter them in the chat. Um, I just wanna reiterate for you all presenters, there has just been a phenomenal um, replies from our participants that they just loved your presentations really happy that you were able to join us today um, <clears throat> and just all the information was really about how you can take action as an individual and so we were really uh, pleased to have that because that is uh, that's where the movement starts and as mm -hmm. Andrew said you got to walk the walk and you really need to really start showing people how you do it and it comes from home and it comes from that example. So if anybody else has any questions, um, we'd really invite you to put it in the chat or if any of you have questions to each other, the presenters, that would be great as well. Um, I could just, may I add one thing? Sure. Um, when, I, when I took the JPIC, the Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation Animators course at the Antonianum, there was another secular Franciscan there from Uganda and his name was Patrick. And I told him, Patrick, I've been told I'm too pushy. And he said to me, of course, if you're a JPIC animator, you're ineffective if you're not pushy. You have to be pushy. Push, push, push. So I quote him all the time. This is from our African uh, secular Franciscan brother. Push, push, push. If Any I could, last comments? Oh, go ahead, Deacon. Um, I, I just want to speak from my own personal experience. Um, word of mouth does a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, I can say that I have was in, I've become a GCCM animator, but as a result of that, I also joined, became, and finished the course with the Lot of the Sea Revolution. 
Oh. And I encourage everyone here to be able to take those courses. Um, we have right now a lot of spare time on our hands um, for those of us who are um, under restrictions vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19. Make the time, take the, take the courses. You may not be able to go outside and demonstrate, but use this time to learn. Um, mm. And so I'm gonna make a big, big plug for the Global Catholic Climate Change Animators Program. If you haven't done so, do it. And then you animate others because that's how a movement starts. Um, you know, um, we had, um, our faith started with 11 shaky apostles. <laughs> um, one of which decided to do something terrible and look what's happened. Um, so, you know, we can start and be pushy and, and bring that across. And I'm sure everybody can, understand, can uh, highlight that. So I really would encourage everyone to do so. That's my little contribution, if I may. If, if I may add, uh, I think uh, one reflection that I also had after thinking about this call is that uh, we all need to make part of our lifestyle changes, uh, being yeah. advocates for the world that we, that we want and we feel called by our faith. And so um, activism, advocacy work has to be part of our lifestyle changes. If we never really thought that our vote or our political action made any difference, this is a time, as Andrew well said, there is no time to lose. If scientists are right that we only have less than 10 years to reverse climate change, this is a time when the voices of the people of God need to be heard. And we've been given that authority uh, by Jesus Christ. So we have to we have to make it uh, put into action through our vote. So a uh, green faith, we're really asking people to vote with compassion during this election. And um, uh, because the life of the planet, humanity is is at stake, our lives, our future generations are at stake. So uh, that that would be another uh, um, ask that we 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 are doing asking to people. <laughs> Valga la redundancia, the way we say in Spanish. And just kind of going back to the comments that Juan Otero Fernandez was asking before in his concern of the U.S. moving away from the Paris Agreement. The good news is that we're still in it and we will be there in it until November 4th. Um, legally, we are not out of it yet, but we can definitely continue putting pressure to the politicians um, and the citizens. We have a way of, of making sure that we stay in the or that we come back to the agreement. And that's, that's what we need to do as people of faith. We have no way of escaping this calling. So hopefully we'll do the right thing. Thanks. Thank you. And a question came in as people are watching our YouTube uh, video live as well. One of the questions is, do you believe that through the UN, it would be possible to establish education in universal and mandatory ecology and economic sustainability from kindergarten on. Um, well, I'll, I'll jump in there with that. And um, then uh, there's a, another question someone asked me if I could just do that one. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, some of this is dependent upon each country and some countries are already doing a lot with that in their education system. And there certainly is the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals that actually have been filtering down into industry and businesses and using those as a, um, you know, a kind of a marker or guideline for how they do business practices. Um, so I, I think that having all of that in education systems, um, those goals, um, the climate is very, very important because we need to be um, working on that since, um, you know, with our children. Um, but someone asked me a question about New Mexico is a sacrifice zone and nuclear weapons, and is my community taking a stance on this? Um, just to state that my Franciscan community decades ago took a stance, a corporate stance, um, opposing nuclear um, proliferation, oh, yeah. nuclear weapons, and um, actually in our current time with climate change, that extends to nuclear energy. Um, and with that here in our state, um, we are fighting a whole tech, which is slated to be the only repository. They're not saying it's a repository, but that's what they're planning uh, for New Mexico, for all of the spent nuclear fuel rods from all the nuclear power plants throughout the entire United States. 
and we have no even one nuclear power plant in the whole state. So it's a huge environmental justice issue, and we have been working on that as Interfaith Power and Light, just to mention also that um, our Archbishop Wester um, was a presenter and spoke at the anniversary of Hiroshima Nagasaki, large event that took place online um, addressing the nuclear weapons issue. So there is engagement here by people of faith in New Mexico around those concerns. Thank you, excellent question. Now, I'd like to invite us to perhaps bring all the wonderful inputs that we've had this afternoon for this webinar together in and close our minds and listen to God's breath in our, in this closing prayer that we can say together in the silence of our hearts. We thank you, creator God, for the goodly heritage you offer us, for green downland and the deep salt seas, and for the abundant world you share with your creation. Keep us so mindful of its needs and those of all with whom we share that open to your spirit, we may discern and practice all that makes for its well-being. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. I wanna thank everyone for joining, everyone who has made this afternoon, this session so valuable and rich. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We thank you very much for everybody at the Global Catholic Climate Movement. And thank you, Angelica, and all those wonderful translators who have had to follow our quick thoughts with even quicker tongues. Thank you so very much. And be assured that we will all keep each other in our prayers. And with that, I wish you all a good day. God bless. And till next time. Thank you very much. Please, La Paz. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Blessings. Bye-bye. Cool, Laval. <laughs>